Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. We welcome each and every single one of you back. Esteemed pleasure to uh, have all of you come back and join us for this class. It's been a while um, as we were coming. So we ask Allah to make school easy on you, easy on your loved ones. We ask Allah to continuously and forever bless each and every single one of you and all of your affairs. Allahumma ameen. And of course, to keep you safe from COVID and what is less than it and what is worse than it. Allahumma ameen, ameen, ameen. So today, we're going to be talking about a very special Nebi. But before that, I just want to take a moment to hear from you all. Uh, who was the prophet that we talked about before? Yeah, okay, good. It's cloudy. Maybe the black backdrop is the key. <laughs> so, uh, who did we talk about last time? Who was the prophet that we spoke about last time we were together? And also share with me one of the takeaways from that story. Anyone? <laughs> okay, then we encourage all of you to go back and watch that video. And remember, a student of knowledge becomes their notes. So it's not enough for you to just take notes in one class or to just be sitting and listening. No matter how you write the notes, type the notes, or, or listen to and make mental notes, um, make sure that you become your notes, inshallah. Otherwise, uh, the pearls, uh, as they say, casting pearls to the swine, it's like you're taking a precious thing and you're, and you're throwing it away, right? Today, we are going to talk about Yunus ibn Umatta. Yunus ibn Umatta. Yunus ibn Umatta is where I get one part of my name from. Ibn Umatta. <laughs> Yunus ibn Umatta. Except uh, I didn't name myself after Nebi Yunus. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, we, there's no such thing as coincidence. Qadrullah from Allah's decree. We also have the name uh, Ibn Metta at the end. Nebi Yunus um, has a very interesting story, and we're going to go through that a little bit. We're going to take from a few different source, uh, source material. We're going to take from al uh, Surah Al-Iyat. We're going to take from Qasus uh, al-Anbiya. And we're going to take from uh, the statement of the Prophet Wasallam about uh, some specific things from Nebi Yusuf. Uh, specifically from uh, the narrations in Sahihain and the in the authentic two, um, as well as the books of Sunan with regards to this noble Nebi. Um, one of the main things that many of us know about uh, Yunus ibn Metta is that he is the Nebi that ran from his people. This is normally the way that it's described. We normally know Yunus as the one who was given a task, was given a responsibility, and he went in the opposite direction from it. Now, we have to be mindful, uh, keep, in, uh, keep at the forefront of your thoughts that MBA prophets, they're not like us, okay? So prophets do not willfully sin. They are ma'asum. Uh, they, they are uh, infallible in the sense that they do not deliberately disobey the command of Allah. So whenever we begin to talk about why did Yunus run, right? Um, he was sent to a specific group of people uh, in a town called Nineveh. And Nineveh was known to be a place of a, uh, a great amount of evil. Um, and it wasn't uh, a place that a person who was going with the message from God would be welcome, let alone be safe. So why did he run? This becomes the question. If he is a Nebi and he's sent by Allah, and he's supposed to go to a people, uh, why did he go in the opposite direction? It's because Yunus ibn Umatta, from his sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and wanted to preserve the message, that Allah uh, had given him, which is to go to the people and teach them la ilaha illallah and to bring them to uh, Islam. He felt that these were people who would never ever embrace this message. He preemptively assumed that. And it's not a negative thing. It's not an evil thing. From a place of maliciousness, there's no point in going there. Let me take my dawah elsewhere. Let me take my dawah elsewhere. Just a reflection in our interpersonal lives. Sometimes we have responsibilities that we want to run from, whether it be the responsibility of cleaning your room, whether it be the responsibility of doing your chores, whether it be the responsibility of doing your laundry, or even something a little bit different. How many people say they hate school? So many people, they say, I hate school. I wish I didn't have to go to school. I hate waking up in the morning. But this is a responsibility that you have to do, uh, especially with online, right? I hate waking up, I hate going to school online, I wish it was the way that it was before. So many, many people, uh, while they're online, all they're doing is they're checking out mentally. They're watching YouTube on the side, playing some video games on the side, they got solitaire set up, I'm doing some little uh, chess online and all types of stuff, just completely distracted. 
many of us have different responsibilities in our lives that we make excuses to run away from. But the first pearl that we pick up from Nebi Yunus is we should never ever run away from our responsibilities. And there's never a good excuse uh, to, uh, there's uh, never a good excuse to leave a good thing. Never a good excuse to leave a good thing. In fact, one of the greatest things that we take from the noble lesson of Yunus Ibn Umatta is we have to be greater than our greatest excuse. All of us have to be greater than our greatest excuse. And this is a good excuse from a good person. If I go there, they're going to reject the message and they're going to get the adab from Allah. Remember the last Nabi? Again, you go back, you watch that video, you find out who it was. Because <laughs> their people got some serious adab that we talked about in that video. Um, if I go there and I share the message of Islam with them, because this is the way that it went for all of the prophets and for all the people who came before us. If we go there, we give them the message and they reject it, they're going to be destroyed. These people, they're not going to accept the message, so let me take the da'wah elsewhere. He gets on the boat, and we know how the story goes. Once he gets on the boat, and, this, and the details of this is fleshed out a little bit more in Isra Iliyat, the people uh, you know, were overtaken by a powerful storm on the ocean. And once that storm started rocking the boat back and forth, uh, in order for the boat to not capsize or to be inundated with the waves that were coming in in the water, the best thing to do in that situation to keep the boat afloat is throw things overboard. So they started uh, taking all of the materials and things that they had on the boat and they just started tossing it overboard into the sea. But the longer the storm went on, the worse it got. So even these people, subhanAllah, look at how the reminder from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came, uh, even in a situation like this, they said, look, this, this is not a normal storm. Allah is mad at us. And it's one of us. One of us is the problem here. So even the people who were taking them in the opposite direction where we're still uh, reminding them uh, the reason why we're in this difficult situation is because the, uh, of something between us and Allah. It's one of us. So whenever you find yourself in the storms of life, whether it be inundated with homework, whether it be overwhelmed with things happening in your family, whether it be uh, overwhelmed with stuff that's happening in the world around you, always look at yourself. Never ever blame the people around you. Uh, they're on a boat. They're in the middle of the ocean. There's a storm raging. And even in the thickness of that moment, they were willing to stop and think to themselves, what's between us and Allah that is causing this bad situation to happen? This concept of self-reflection is so important. Each and every single one of us have to be self-reflective, especially when it comes to the storms that are raging in all of our lives. So in order to find out who the person was, they decided to draw lots. Uh, what, what they would do is a person would take like a handful of sticks and uh, one of the sticks would be shorter than the rest. But whenever you're holding all of them in your hand, you can't tell which one is, is uh, the short stick. And so what they did was uh, everyone drew a stick. And whoever drew the short stick was the one that they decided, we're going to throw you overboard. So, of course, they all draw lots. They all draw the sticks. And who pulls the short one? None but Yunus ibn Mepta. So at this, they took him and they threw him overseas. And this is actually mentioned in detail in uh, Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21, verse number 87. Once he is thrown out, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he called on his on his Lord from, from Dhulumat. Dhulumat. Dhulum is like uh, darkness. It's darkness. The plural of it is Dhulumat. Uh, in Tafsir Ibn Kathir, it mentions that the Dhulumat that he was calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was from three layers. Three layers of darkness. One was the darkness of the night. Because when the storm came, it came at night. The second was uh, in the darkness of the ocean at the very bottom of it, which is the darkest part of the ocean. And third, from the darkness of the belly of a well. Whenever, or whenever he was thrown overboard, he was uh, eaten by, some said it's a Leviathan. It's just a massive, massive sea creature. Others said it was a whale. Others said, uh, and this is why it surfaced. Look, look, at the, look at the intelligence at work here. <laughs> it, it must have been a whale because this is why it came up to the surface. And this is why it eventually put him back on the surface. Because, you know, whales don't stay exclusively underwater, but fish do. Others said, no, it was just a very, very large fish. But the truth is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Either way, three layers of darkness. The darkness of the night. At the darkness of the bottom of the ocean. And the darkness of the belly of the whale. Here in this moment... Uh, once the whale, or, or let's say fish, let's say Leviathan, because Leviathan, it sounds cool. <laughs> the Leviathan 
it begins to plummet to the bottom of the ocean. And once its stomach began to scrape along the bottom of the ocean, Yunus ibn Matta, he heard the rocks make tasbih. He heard the rocks make tasbih. That uh, calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying subhanallah. Once he heard the rocks make tasbih, that's when he made tasbih too. He said, oh Allah, I'm calling on you from a place that no one has worshipped you from before. In the stomach of the Leviathan, he positioned himself in a way to where he could prostrate. And he said, Allah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, worshiping you and I'm calling on you from a place no human being from mankind has ever called on you before. And in Surah Tisafat, in the uh, uh, 37th chapter of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that if it hadn't been for the fact that he was from Al-Musabbihin, meaning from the people who made tasbih, when he heard the rocks, he made tasbih too. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he would have been in there until uh, Yom al-Ba'ath, until the resurrection, until the day of judgment, subhanAllah. So whenever you find yourself in the belly of the well, what is the solution out? What is the way out? Tasbih. And what was the tasbih of Yunus ibn Matta that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said? There's no one that makes this dua except that when they make this dua, Allah will answer. Allah will answer your dua after. La ilaha illa ant. There's absolutely nothing worthy of worship except for you. Subhanak, glorified are you, free from imperfection are you. When you do tasbih, it's like anything that anyone could say about Allah that could not even come close to remotely uh, true, could not even come close to being accurate, could not even come close to being correct. Tasbih is it frees Allah from any wrong thing could, that could ever, ever be uh, ascribed to him. This is a part of the reason why one of the most common honorifics that's added to the name of Allah whenever you hear a person speaking is they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes they say it too fast and it sounds like they're saying a P. It sounds like they're saying some extra. So subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the type of tasbih. Where you, uh, whatever you're saying about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe the person who's saying Allah's name is given a story. Or maybe whenever they're talking about Allah, they're given a similitude or they're describing things that are happening in our lives. And just so that you do not think that Allah is like anything in any given situation, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We separate in him and saying that he is uh, perfect in every way, shape, form, or fashion, far or removed and high above anything that could ever be ascribed to him, associated with him, or described uh, uh, you know, to him, unbefitting of his characteristics, majesty, majesty and glory. Azza wa Jalla, man taqaddasu, izzatan wa jalala. So, uh, whenever he found himself in the belly of the well, he made tasbih. He freed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from any, any wrongdoing. It's not you, it's me. La ilaha illa ant. There's nothing worthy of worship except you alone without partners. Whenever we come back to this point of tahlil, whenever we remember the purpose of life, this is one of the, uh, the keys to finding direction. This is one of the keys to finding a way out of our difficulty. Then that tasbih kicks in, subhanak. Glorified are you, far are you removed. You know, sometimes a person be thinking about Allah and they think evil thoughts about Allah. So, uh, I, you know, working with youth, sometimes you hear a kid say, why did Allah, it's like, what is it? Hold on, time to then, then pause. Chill out. What do you mean, why did Allah? Why did Allah? Why did Allah? Well, why does it say in the Quran? Mm -mm -mm. We're not talking about a person who just says things. We're not talking about a human being that just does things. We're talking about the one that created everything that is with kun fair kun, with be, and so it became. So we need to make sure that even in our own thoughts, in our own feelings, that we're not thinking about Allah like Allah is like us. Like we're not thinking about Allah uh, like Allah is like a human being, like Allah is biased. Like Allah is a, a chauvinistic, like Allah is oppressive. No, no, no. These are characteristics that belong to human, human beings. Allah is far removed from that. And that's the reason why la ilaha illa ant. And this is the reason why affirm, we affirm it with subhanak. And kuntumina dhalimin, it's me who was uh, from the people who wronged themselves. Whenever we talk about uh, dhulm, he's calling on Allah from the dhulumat. And now he's saying, I'm the one who wronged myself. I'm the one who, who had oppressed myself in this situation. Oppress yourself how? And most of the problems that we face in our life, it just comes from not doing what Allah told us to do. Most of the solutions that we find in our lives, it would just come from just doing what Allah told us to do. 
And anytime you find yourself leaving the limits of Allah, again, the story, uh, the lesson that we take from the story is we have to be greater than our greatest excuses. Is whenever we finally just do what Allah told us to do, this is the way to rectify the situation. And actually met the Prophet after he had gone to a city named Ta'if in order to get them to become Muslim. And at that time, they rejected the Prophet Muhammad And he ran into a, sl uh, a slave who was actually from the city of Nineveh. And when the Prophet saw them talk to him and he heard that he was from Nineveh, he said, that is from, uh, that's the same place that my brother Yunus ibn Umatta is from, meaning I'm a prophet just like him. And that person, he became Muslim because of it. And now today, look at Ta'if, they're all Muslim. Just like how Nineveh had all become Muslim. So these are similitudes and signs for those who reflect. So some of the pearls that we take away from this uh, prophetic example is first and foremost, you gotta be greater than your greatest excuse. You never find a good excuse to go away from doing a good thing. Sometimes the doubts and fears that you have can be resolved just by doing what Allah told you to do. Sometimes a person, oh, it's hailing? Subhanallah. La ilaha illa Subhanak inni kuntu min Um Subhanallah. Nabi Yunus said, inni kuntu min al-dhalimeen, meaning indeed unequivocally without fail. I'm the one who was from the ones who wronged themselves. So y'all are even finding yourselves in a storm now. So uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to uh, keep you all safe. Uh, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it a beneficial cloud and may Allah keep your, your property uh, safe from harm. May Allah preserve your power. May Allah um, preserve your, your homes and may Allah keep the fear out of your heart. Um, you know, these are just the signs from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, you know, they're the signs for those who reflect. Last, last pearl. Whenever you find yourself in the belly of the well, tasbih is your way out. Remember Allah, glorify Allah. Remember that he is greater than what can be perceived in your mind. And because of that, submit to the sublime. All right? And you know we had to end it with a rock. <laughs> so with that, we're going to call time. And inshallah, we see you next time. <laughs> Barakallahu fikum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We see you all at the end of next month. Whenever we come together, we're going to talk about, we'll announce the Nabi in advance. I, I got to think about the next one. Inshallah. Ahsanallahu alaikum. Wassalamu alaikum.